Hello everyone, my name is Alexander Damron. I'm a board certified pathologist in anatomic and clinical pathology. I did my residency training at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, followed by a one-year fellowship in breast pathology at the University of Pennsylvania. So I just kind of started this channel and one of the things I wanted to do was to start showing interesting cases in breast pathology by showing at least, you know, one case of the month. Um, so this will be the first case of the month that I'll do. Um, this is for June 2019. Um, and going forward, if there's, you know, any particular entity or something that you're interested in, you can always put something in the comments and I'll try to discuss that in maybe one of the later cases of the month. So this is the first case of the month that I'm doing. So I would like to start this one off with just with a little bit of information about myself. Obviously going forward, you know, I won't include this portion, but a little intro into who I am. Um, I grew up in a small town in West Virginia um, it's called Scott Depot. And from there, I decided to travel to South Carolina for my undergraduate degree um, in biological sciences at Clemson University. And not only did I earn that degree, but I came very proficient at rooting for Clemson football, um, as well as tailgate. Uh, the experience there was really great. So from on, I um, was on to medicine in which I went to the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. And from there, I traveled to Houston, Texas, halfway across the country to do my residency in anatomic and clinical pathology at the Baylor College of Medicine. Um, really a fantastic experience there. And then decided to move back all the way across the country once again to do my fellowship in breast pathology at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. All right, so our first case of the month is really going to be centered on one of the pitfalls in pathology or just breast pathology in general. Um, so, you know, showing this game, I don't know if you've heard of this game. This is Pitfall, which came out in 1982. It was released by Activision, and you had 20 minutes to traverse the entire level while kind of avoiding obstacles. So I uh, just thought I'd throw this in there. But our first case is going to be, you know, one of the pitfalls in breast pathology that I think is very important um, for all pathologists to be able to recognize so we don't make this mistake. So let's get started with the case. Um, this is a 47-year-old female presented for just routine screening mammogram and was found to have architectural distortion, which led to a biopsy of this um, area in her breast. And so you're going to get this core here. And on core, on low power, you do see kind of a bland uh, glands that look like they're pretty infiltrative. You don't really see a lobulocentric pattern of the normal breast architecture here, right? We kind of have these uh, pretty uniform glands here infiltrating throughout even into the fat. So it's pretty concerning on low power. And then as we look a little bit closer at these glands, um, again, they do have an infiltrative pattern, right? They're kind of kind of insidiously infiltrating throughout the adipose tissue here and they're pretty uniform though and all really nice and well gland forming and in fact if we look at these glands they have very uniform nuclei we don't see any mitoses the nuclear pleomorphism isn't there and some of these glands are filled with this eosinophilic intraluminal secretion um, and also one of the important things that we look at in breast pathology is whether glands have a myopithelial cell layer and if we look at these glands it looks like they don't actually it looks like like it has one single layer kind of a cuboidal type cells with this really monotonous nuclei and no myopathial cell layer. So you do your uh, biomarkers on this and it turns out that all these uh, glands show no staining for estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, um, and also you do your myopathelial marker, whichever one you choose. Generally, I like to do two, um, but you know, for the purpose of the presentation, just show one, this is P63, which is a nuclear stain. And of course, there's no evidence of a myopathelial cell layer within this lesion. So what's your differential diagnosis? How do you kind of want to approach this? The first thing you have to decide, well, is this invasive? You know, is this an infiltrating uh, lesion that I'm concerned about a carcinoma? Um, is it sclerosing adenosis? We know sclerosing adenosis can sometimes, um, you know, when you do your myopathial stains, they may not be there just because the sclerosis is so much that the myopathial cell layer may be attenuated. Um, but still, generally, you should see some myopathial cell staining. Or is it another entity called microglandular adenosis? So what's wrong with this picture in the sense of, you know, if you're thinking about calling this invasive cancer? So we know we have an infiltrative lesion, so we've already decided it's infiltrative, and now we have to decide, is this a malignant infiltrative process, or is it a more benign thing um, where we would be leading down the road of possibly sclerosing adenosis or possibly just microglandular adenosis? And really what's wrong with this picture and something that should tip you off is that, 
the estrogen and progesterone stain receptor. So if you went the route of thinking that this is potentially a well-differentiated carcinoma or a tubular carcinoma, and you got to the point of ordering your biomarkers, your estrogen, progesterone, and HER2, you say, okay, well, if you got to that point and you get those stains back and they're negative, the question, you know, what's wrong here is, well, how often are those type of lesions negative for estrogen receptor? And in fact, almost never, right? 99% of tubular carcinoma should be estrogen receptor positive. And in this report, you know, I'd really like to see the 1% because probably the 1% may not necessarily be a tubular carcinoma. Um, and then, you know, 97% of well-differentiated uh, breast carcinomas are positive for estrogen receptors. So as soon as you get to this point in your case, if you were down the route of, and I've seen this happen several times, you know, we've had consults where they send it and they have this description, you know, this doesn't make sense. I've got this really well differentiated infiltrative lesion, but it's estrogen receptor negative. And you need to stop and think here and put the right differential in your mind and that it could be um, and where we're heading is microglandular adenosis. And something that you can do to help you, and I've, I use this stain, I found this whenever I was a first year resident, I used this in one of my um, unknowns, but you know, I really like this picture, but you know, one of the things that you can do is throw stains at it, right? And as I've grown older and I've got kids now, I've really become more proficient with this stain here. But again, we can throw immuno stains at this to help us if we're still kind of on the fence of what we want to call this lesion. And a really good stain that's going to help you with this specific diagnosis is S100. So here we go on the same biopsy. You can see we've done S100 and it shows very strong uh, cytoplasmic and uh, nuclear staining of this lesion. Okay, this is very characteristic of this lesion, this S100 staining. So the diagnosis is microglandular adenosis. And the pitfall that people have is calling this invasive cancer. And we're going to talk about you know, all the histologic features of microglandular adenosis, a little bit about the differential to help you avoid this mistake. So let's talk about microglandular adenosis just a little bit. And again, it's characterized as we showed in the biopsy from our case, that it has a very bland, you know, nuclei. They're all really, you know, not pleomorphic. It's really nice formed tubules, no mitoses, no nuclear pleomorphism, and a very characteristic eosinophilic luminal secretion that is seen in microglandular adenosis that you're not going to see in invasive, well-differentiated, or tubular carcinoma. And, you know, this does lack a myoepithelial cell layer, so in breast pathology, that's going to obviously bring concern, right? Um, in fact, this is the only benign lesion in the breast that lacks myoepithelial cell layer. But what it does have that an invasive lesion wouldn't have is an intact basement membrane. And sometimes it's a little thickened on H&E, but a little difficult to appreciate, you know, and make that acid, you know, to actually say, oh, that's thickened basement membrane as opposed to a little bit of fibrosis right beside it. Um, but what you can do is a basement membrane immunostain, such as laminin or collagen 4, and it'll actually highlight the basement membrane that surrounds these glands. But, you know, you should know that, you know, this is a good picture here, but, you know, we've done this stain before and it's very difficult to read because sometimes the basement membrane stain can be very faint. Um, it may look like it's not really there. Um, and that particular stain can be difficult to, you know, accurately read. So microglandular adenosis is a very rare lesion. And in fact, as I mentioned before, it is the only epithelial lesion that is classified as benign that indeed will lack a myopithelial cell layer. Um, it can present as a palpable mass or a mammographic density such as architectural distortion, but most often it's really just an incidental finding in a specimen that's biopsied or taken out for another reason because MGA typically doesn't necessarily produce a mammographic or palpable finding. It's never been reported to metastasize or invade outside of the breast, although local recurrence is possible. And we're going to talk about local recurrence um, a little bit later because that's kind of important in this particular entity. And the big thing to note, as I've mentioned, is that the biomarkers are going to be triple negative and S100 will be strongly positive. So one of the things to note about microglandular adenosis is that about 25% of these are associated with invasive cancer at the time of diagnosis or at recurrence. And typically, the invasive carcinoma is going to share a similar protein expression as the MGA if it arose from MGA. So the cancer would be triple negative and also positive for S100. So it's been shown that microglandular adenosis is considered a non-obligate precursor for some triple negative carcinoma. 
melanomas, obviously a very small percentage of them because microglangular adenosis in and of itself is rare. The pitfall of it is that if you just have MGA by itself, it's going to mimic a well-differentiated invasive carcinoma. It lacks a myopathial cell layer, so you can't really make that distinction based on myopathial cell stains. You need to use your H&E diagnosis or, you know, also an S100 to help you, but keep in mind that S100 can show positivity in some breast cancers, but in MGA, it should be kind of strong and diffused throughout the whole um, specimen. And the big clue is the absence of hormone receptors. As I mentioned before, you're not really going to get a well-differentiated or tubular carcinoma that's going to be negative for your estrogen receptor hormones. So looking at the molecular evidence of MGA that supported it as a non-obligate precursor to some triple negative cancers, uh, Dr. Shin and Dr. Rosen and their team, you know, wrote this, you know, really well done article. And basically what you need to know from this is that the molecular data suggested that microglandular adenosis, atypical microglandular adenosis and carcinoma arising in those in single cases were clonally related, which implicated MGA as a non-obligate precursor for the development of intraductal and invasive ductal carcinoma um, in some cases. So let's show an example of that. Again, this is a, another case we had on the right. You can see, you know, this is, you know, clearly more microglandular adenosis. You have your nice eosinophilic luminal secretions here. You know, you could argue some of this is atypical microglandular adenosis with this elongated um, type of architecture here, a little bit of architectural abnormality compared to your just nice single uniform rounded glands. But on low power, you can appreciate a little different lesion, you know, on the left side of the image, right over here, we have our microglandular adenosis, microglandular adenosis, and in fact this here is actually invasive ductal carcinoma. So if we look at this lesion on a little bit higher power, um, you can see here on the right side of this image, we have again this microglandular adenosis, but now we have these kind of irregular trabeculae, a little darker nuclei, a little bit more pleomorphic nuclei. So this is microglandular adenosis, and we have right um, within it this invasive carcinoma. And a little bit higher power of just the invasive carcinoma, you can appreciate it kind of has this cribiform architecture. Um, there's a mitosis right here, maybe another one here some nuclear pleomorphism within this. So this is more indicative of a infiltrating ductal carcinoma. So this was an S100 that was done on that case. And as I mentioned earlier, generally the protein expression of a carcinoma arising from MGA will show the same protein expression and would be S100 positive. But as you can see in this case, we had our um, infiltrating carcinoma here on the left was actually negative for S100 and the microglandular adenosis was positive for S100. Um, so this is a pretty awesome image. Um, and this was more likely just a sporadic breast cancer that happened to arise in topographical association with microglandular adenosis. Um, but I wanted to show that this image to show you know, the difference of S100 staining in MGA compared to invasive cancer if you were kind of thinking about that as your differential, maybe on a biopsy. Um, and we'll talk about um, the association between MGA and cancer versus a topographical association in just a little bit as well. So in this case, it was an infiltrating, moderately differentiated duct carcinoma with associated microglandular adenosis. And I want to use this moment to talk a little bit about microglandular adenosis at margins. In that particular case, microglandular adenosis was really throughout the breast, very diffuse manner, and present at multiple margins. And surgically, you know, it's not really sure what we should do with that. If we have MGA at a margin, you know, should we go back and excise? And generally, the answer is no. It's not thought that they need to re-excise for MGA, but as pathologists certainly recommend that we report MGA at a margin because we know it is a non-obligate precursor for triple negative breast cancers. Obviously, we don't know the percentage, how much, you know, how often would these progress versus how not. It's such a rare entity that we just don't have that type of data, but we do know that it can recur at a margin, and we also know that MGA is a non-obligate precursor. So I think it is important to, um, you know, give the clinicians an idea of how much MGA there is at a margin, right? Is it focally involving a margin? Is it extensively involving a margin? And which margins are involved? I do think you should put that in your reports um, going forward. 
So let's talk a little bit about the differential diagnosis just briefly um, of microglandular adenosis. Again, one of the things you may consider is a tubular carcinoma or a well-differentiated ductal carcinoma. Again, they're going to like lack of myopathyl so layers similarly to MGA, but the tubules are generally a little bit more irregular, variable in size and shape, and they have these kind of pointed edges to them compared to the nice round um, glands that you're going to see in MGA. And also tubular carcinoma typically doesn't have the eosinophil secretions in, inside the lumen that MGA does, as well as the stroma um, of infiltrating cancers tends to be a little bit desmoplastic. In some tubular carcinomas, it can be subtle and maybe not at all, but if you see a desmoplastic stroma, that can certainly help you. And the uniformity of the tubular carcinoma in the sense that you have these glands that are kind of uniform throughout are going to help you differentiate that from sclerosing adenosis. Um, and also, most importantly, as we've mentioned several times, tubular carcinoma should always be ERPR positive. Another entity that we want to keep in our differential is sclerosing adenosis. And this is a benign proliferation similar to MGA, but it's going to be a proliferation of acini around a single duct, and you're going to have sclerosis that can sometimes make the you know, glands in the middle look a little more attenuated. But the most important H&E about these, this entity is that it maintains a lobulocentric pattern. So this is really a low power thing you want to appreciate is that it still has this lobulocentric normal breast type architecture, but the lobule is larger, more acini, and maybe some sclerosis associated with it. It does have an increased risk for the development of an invasive cancer in either breast, and the stain that's going to differentiate this from, you know, a tubular carcinoma or MGA is that it still should have an intact myopathyl cell layer. Now, it can be a little attenuated if you're looking at it just in the areas that are completely sclerotic. Sometimes it can be so attenuated that the staining can be faint or even not there, but somewhere in the lesion you should see some myopathyl cell staining. All right, so just to summarize, while MGA is rare, you really need to consider this diagnosis in a case that looks well differentiated and you're thinking about a tubular carcinoma and you do your biomarkers and it ends up coming back as ER negative. It's very important that you don't overcall that as invasive cancer, obviously for treatment reasons, um, but you really need to take a step back when you get those biomarkers and they're negative and that was your differential. Um, so while it's important to recognize MGA, it's also equally important not to overlook an adjacent true invasive invasive carcinoma. As I mentioned earlier, 25% of these are associated with invasive cancer at the time of diagnosis or at the time of MGA reoccurrence. So while it's important to not overcall MGA, it's equally important really to not just see MGA and just assume the whole thing is MGA. In fact, there may be invasive cancer somewhere on the specimen. And then carcinoma arising from MGA as a precursor is typically going to show the same biomarker protein expression as microglandular adenosis, aka it's going to be triple negative and probably S100 positive. However, because of the common nature of breast cancer, right, we know one in eight women are going to experience this disease, and the rarity of microglandular adenosis, it's not unheard of to think that a sporadic estrogen receptor positive tumor could arise in association with MGA, and not necessarily from MGA. So keep that in mind. You may get a cancer that has adjacent MGA where the cancer ends up being estrogen receptor positive. That's not necessarily impossible. It's just been shown in the clonality case cases of MGA that become cancer, those cancers show the same protein expression. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. This is the first, you know, interesting cases in breast pathology. I'm going to try to do a case of the month on the channel. I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope you find it helpful. I'll try to do really interesting cases. Um, if you leave any comments on this in the below section, I'll do my best to respond to those. Um, if you like the content and you want to see future um, uploads that I do, just subscribe to the channel. You can hit the bell there and you'll get notified when new cases are uploaded. Obviously, I have a full-time job and the kids and family, so I'm not going to be creating content all the time but I'll try to definitely do interesting cases of the month, so at least the case of the month, um, as well as some review series that I'm working on. And if there's any particular entities you're interested in seeing, um, again, put that in the comment, and I'll try to you know, dig in my cases, see if I can find an example of that, and we can discuss that. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you did, you know, like and subscribe to the channel, and hopefully we'll see you next time.